Detroit is a travel executive, a land developer, a tree farmer, a conservationist. He was this country's first director of the United States Travel Service and has served as mayor of Southern Pines, North Carolina, and as a North Carolina state senator. His business and political activities are directed from Southern Pines, North Carolina, where he resides with his uh, wife and five children. Mr. Gilmore is an officer and director of two conservation organizations, the American Forestry Association and the North Carolina Forestry Association. He is also a director of the North Carolina Forestry Foundation, and uh, it's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce to you tonight Boyd Gilmore. Boyd. this on? Good. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Charles Staffenfield. Am I all right on volume there? How about up there? Good. Yeah, I think the fact that uh, he built a house for me 10 years ago and we're still on speaking terms is a uh, good commentary and it's a beautiful house and one that uh, as a second home up on the edge of the the most visited national park in all the United States uh, gives me a, a special sense of uh, pleasure. We still can hardly believe that uh, our favorite Western North Carolina architect is out in Indiana, but we are delighted that you're here and we are happy to see such a, a wonderful uh, institution that you're associated with. Also in our audience tonight is a a wonderful gentleman named John Fisher, and I was about to tell him the story because he's had a background out in eastern Tennessee and uh, western North Carolina. We've got a new interstate that's come through that's caused us to all put shoes on and, and uh, stopped acting like hillbillies, but as we get uh, this new interstate traffic that comes through, we've uh, had some curious things, and a man with New York license plate stopped down there not long ago seeing a little boy walking along and said uh, is it true they make a lot of white lightning up in these hills and he said yes it's true and he said well could you take me to a still he said oh yes he said there's just one up the trail here well he said i'll give you five dollars if you'll take me up there because i've always wanted to see a still and just see how these fellows beat the law out and, and uh, make a run of uh, of white lightning so he parked and the little boy started him up there and they walked and they walked and he was way up the hill and the little boy turned and said, that'll be $5, please. Well, he said, that's fine. I'll just pay you the $5 when I get back down to the car. And he said, no, sir, said, if it's all the same to you, said, just pay me the $5 now because you ain't coming back. Well, that's what's happening up in the hills of Western North Carolina. We're getting a little bit civilized, uh, Charles, and we, uh, have down there some some interesting architecture. I would like very much to have you come down and help us defend our frontiers because the last I heard there's a new master plan that your your landscape folks will be interested in. The decision that's been reached at least in the National Park Service is that there are well with the 7.8 million visitor count that they had last summer which may be tempered a little bit this year by uh, the end of the fuel shortage, they now find that all their rangers are doing nothing but turning into parking lot attendants and they have to hang out the uh, no space available sign as of about three o'clock every day and it's just not much fun anymore. So the master plan in Washington is to simply rip out the road that runs from Gatlinburg over to uh, Cherokee and onto Asheville put in a perimeter boulevard around the entire Great Smoky Park, have 12 entryways that would let you go in from this perimeter boulevard to uh, either a recreation area or to a place that would have uh, commercial services such as hotels and eating establishments or into places where for hire uh, horses would be available. And uh, we found that the road that uh, is thus contemplated was drawn on contours not according to any other plan just by some people in a little glass house up in Washington 
and it goes right through the house that you built for us. So we may have to man the guns on that one a little bit. My role in being with you tonight is uh, that of, of uh, a great pleasure that I'm having this year. I'm a tree farmer. I have a, uh, a program of planting Fraser fir trees as a, uh, both as a hobby and as a business investment to be harvested in their eighth growing year uh, as Christmas trees. And I wanted very much to have a man named uh, Bob Kern with me tonight. Is anybody here from over around Rochester? Uh, let's see. Uh, I think it's Rochester, Indiana. Anybody from around there, have you heard of a, a man named Bob Kern who harvests in one year more Christmas trees than I ever dreamed existed? He must cut about 100 or 200,000 a year. And uh, he's out of the country at the moment. But uh, he's a member, a, a strong member of the American Forestry Association. And I wanted very much to go out and, and see his uh, plantation tomorrow. But in the process of having produced lumber, as a, uh, as a lumber manufacturer, I got interested more and more in the conservation aspect of forestry and have now swung around from cutting trees to just planting trees. And I have a series of tree farms that I'm operating. And thus it is that I have uh, now become this year the president of the American Forestry Association. And at the invitation of your school, would like for a few minutes tonight to discuss with you some of the things it does and perhaps suggest a few ways in which uh, we have common cause with those of you that are young people looking toward a future in America, and also those of you that are interested in architecture or any aspect of construction, because uh, keeping trees coming for America is a, a pretty critical part of uh, uh, my role, and, and I hope yours in years to come. The American Forestry Association is an organization of, of 75,000 uh, Americans, non-political and independent, who simply banded together for the advancement of uh, the intelligent management and use of our forests and our soil and our water and our wildlife and all of those related natural resources that are necessary for the for the well-being of of our uh, of our country we're working for a continuing supply of construction lumber plywood and furniture core stock so that uh, architects will have jobs when they finally become architects and want to build uh, buildings in the united states we're about a hundred years old and uh, thus happen to be the oldest conservation organization in the country aligned with other veteran and rather senior organizations that you may have heard of, such as the Sierra Club, the Isaac Walden League, the Audubon Society, the National Wildlife Foundation, and, and many others. But those are sort of the granddaddies of this whole field of conservation, and they came along and had their reason for being many years before this recent ecological scare that began to get everybody into the act about five or 10 years ago. We sometimes have a little bit of disagreement with, uh, with some of those uh, uh, establishments because some of them are strongly oriented toward what should be called preservation as opposed to conservation. And the conservation means the wise use of natural resources and thus the perpetuation of them so we don't exhaust them. Preservation implies that you don't touch a thing, that you don't even use it. And uh, that's a difficult thing in a country that's growing, a country that has a dynamic economy. And often you'll find preservationists who say, don't do anything with our resources. And at times that's desirable in such things as wilderness areas where you don't want nature to have anything uh, impeded. But at the same time, we know we've got to keep on using resources if we're going to make glass jars or if we're going to make lumber or we're going to have furniture or anything else. Our organization is... Uh, very concerned with legislation that uh, is always in the mill, both in Washington and in state legislatures. And in connection with uh, our current issues, we're talking on Capitol Hill about the Eastern Wilderness Bill. We are interested in wilderness areas. And you know the definition of a wilderness area, whether it occurs, well, mostly in national forests, but sometimes in national parks, is that that shall be a section of government land in which man does absolutely nothing. Now the policy is if there's a forest fire there, just let it burn out. In other words, leave the 
area exactly as nature put it there so that young people, generations ahead, will have an opportunity in various parts of our country to see nature precisely as it was when man first came. It's getting tough to do that, but you still do it in those areas, and we are finding that the encroachment of civilization is, is so rapid and so alarming that it is desirable that we uh, have Congress enact the Eastern Wilderness Bill that will protect in its primeval, pristine uh, state many areas of the Eastern United States. Already we've got a good many designated in the West, and we're similarly interested, uh, well, for example, right now in uh, yeah. the Idaho and One Salmon the River nature wilderness nature area. And if you've done a float trip on the Salmon the River, you know what the magnificent country it is. But there are power companies that want to build dams the out there. The there side. are mining companies yeah. that have got uh, stakes got that uh, they want to go in now and start mining. There yeah, are page. old squatters that have been out there, and the result is that he we've got, got little pockets of, of, uh, of intrusion, which like are potentially going to destroy the wilderness state. In the case of the Idaho and Salmon River wilderness areas, there are about 1.2 million acres of land that we're trying very hard to get the United States government congressional action to designate uh, for the preservation of the wilderness status uh, for all time. Well, we're interested in legislation that would relate to a, a thing that you may not have heard of called the tussock moth. T-U-S-S-O-C-K. -S the tussock moth is a, O-C-H, I should say, tussock, it is, is a moth that, that is just beginning to be an infestation that's going to be as serious pretty soon as the uh, Dutch elm disease, which is wiping out the elms in New England, right. or the chestnut blight that Charlie wiped out the chestnuts in all of the South uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, this past year, there were 580,000 acres of Douglas fir forest that were completely defoliated and will thus ultimately be ruined by this little thing called the tussock moth. And alternates to DDT simply are not doing the trick in killing it. Uh, I've been talking this evening with folks about the uh, chemical intake of, uh, of lakes, some of your natural lakes here in uh, uh, Marshall, I guess. Really, we're talking about one lake that, that could be contaminated more by agricultural insecticides, pesticides, and fertilizers that uh, cause everybody to be concerned, and in the case of DDT, caused a complete ban on the use of it. And yet DDT is the only thing that really will knock off the tussock moth. So we've got some very touchy legislation that Congress would have to pass on to allow the one-time shot use of DDT in controlling the tussock moth. We're interested in that. It's a highly debatable thing, but it's of great concern to us. We're interested in the higher use tax. One of the things that's going to knock forestry off in America is the increasing tendency of county and local taxing agencies to pass taxes on land which people intend to be used as forest land or as agricultural land or as what you call suburban land, but saying, actually, we're going to put a tax on this as though it should be apartment land or condominium land. And when you do that and put the tax up that high, it forces the guy that owns the land to simply sell his land or, or actually to bring apartments or condominiums or houses into it. It's knocking off a lot of potential forest land in the United States, and we're trying to strike a balance with taxing authorities saying, if a fellow genuinely wants to keep his land and raise trees, then at least give him a tax structure that allows him to continue to raise trees. Don't force him to sell his land, cut his trees, and just turn it into another row of houses. We're trying to modernize the general mining laws of the United States. Mining is still operated under the General Mining Law of the United States of 1872, which says that you can go out, uh, claim land for, for a de prospecting and developing, and uh, do all kinds of things, which never visualized in 1872, which was the age of a drag pan and a pick and a shovel, going into the bulldozer. And you should see some of the places maybe you have out in the West today, or even in the East in many places, where under that old law, People can go in with a bulldozer and just absolutely rip the land apart and just almost leave it without replacement. We've got to tighten up the laws on strip mining and uh, we're desperately concerned that unless we update it fast that we could further uh, destroy uh, a good bit of our beautiful land. We've got a, a great deal of concern over the Environmental Protection Agency and its current problems uh, with the 
tendency of big business and industry in America to uh, come in and say, okay, during the energy crisis, let's let up on a lot of these EPA rules that are going into effect on such things as uh, pollution devices for automobiles or for the uh, use of, uh, of soft coal. Uh, maybe, see, Wall Street Journal, March 22, last Friday, discussion of the the real problems that Russell Train, the head of the Environment Protection, Environmental Protection Agency, remember he succeeded Ruckel's house uh, just a few months uh, back, and the uh, Wall Street Journal is reporting this. White House officials have already outlined their coming legislative proposals to the press, and Russell Train, who heads EPA and is a terribly dedicated man, has said that he fears that they're going to be, that these exceptions that the White House is going to propose will be expanded into a Christmas tree of plans that will be disastrous for the environment. The White House, this is the Wall Street Journal, the White House will probably propose that power plants be allowed to disperse air pollutants into the atmosphere through tall smokestacks instead of short smokestacks, which sounds interesting. The EPA, in effect, has rejected such dispersion as a long-term control technique in most situations and has ordered instead stepped up installation of costly scrubbers for cleaning up the plant's emissions. Another expected proposal from the White House would change the National Environmental Policy Act to exempt energy projects such as strip mining, nuclear power plant construction, oil shale development, and offshore drilling from currently required environmental and uh, impact reviews. Mr. Train strongly supports such reviews. Well, just like these laws, well, like one that comes to my mind, you said I was a Democrat, and it comes quickly to my mind, is the fact that they passed the rule, you know, on undisclosed gifts to political parties, and what was it, about $5 million that was picked up by the Secretary of Commerce, who's now on trial in New York City, because the night before the law went into effect, they got about 4 or $5 million from donors who didn't want their name listed. And this sounds like exactly the same thing all over again, except this time the White House. And they haven't, according to this article, bothered to tell Russell Train about it. They just announced in the White House that because some industries would be inconvenienced, that they would allow strip mining and uh, these other things that I've just listed uh, to, to be uh, moved in right now just as a temporary relief because of the energy crisis. Well, you can just imagine how many people will come in and just, you know, move the first 10 feet of dirt to say we started the strip mine, taking advantage of this temporary reprieve. And Russell Train, who's a dedicated public servant, is justifiably uh, in a great strut over the thing and has told the White House that he's probably going to quit unless they straighten it out. We are, as a citizens' conservation organization, terribly concerned about this kind of thing that's happening. And it happens, unfortunately, in direct relationship, apparently, to how much political leverage you can put under the White House. Am among the things that, that uh, we like to do, introducing Americans to their country and letting them see the kinds of value that we have in our national forest, is a program called Trail Rides of the Wilderness. This summer, beginning in June, with a ride down at the Great Smoky Park and going all the way through wilderness areas and national forest areas uh, out as far as Alaska, we will have a total of, uh, of 36 trail rides, which take uh, from 12 to 30 people along on pack trips with animals and pack trains into remote areas of national forests and national parks of the United States. We've been doing that in cooperation with the U.S. government, Park Service and Forest Service since 1933. And it's one of the greatest ways on a, we make no profit on it, we just do it on a break-even basis, whatever the outfitting costs, to take Americans in and let them see some of the natural resources that we have. We've now expanded our program to include the American Forestry Association abroad, and uh, that will include a trip leaving next month and going through and visiting the forests of Russia and of Scandinavia. Now the American Forestry Association has got a number of, of action uh, programs that, uh, that it's uh, busy with. Publishing a, a, a magazine called The American Forests, which is one of the authentic uh, uh, words on uh, forestry practices in America. That's a monthly that I hope perhaps comes to your library here. We have many publications, such as Know Your Trees and other things that inform both children and adults on our forest heritage in this uh, country. 
and we are terribly concerned about the fact that growing trees doesn't amount to a lot if you aren't protecting them from insects or from diseases or from fires. And so we occasionally have congresses, national congresses, in which we bring technicians, uh, educators, and uh, specialists in the general area of updating our techniques. And firefighting has become now, uh, in the world of forestry, about as sophisticated a game as the updating of, of police techniques or, or, uh, or uh, city firefighting, as a matter of fact. Smoke jumpers have become a, a tremendously sophisticated thing. The use of helicopters where people rappel down now into fires rather than just jumping at random and go in and start backfires. Uh, the, the whole technique of the detective work. More than half the forest fires in America are caused by arson. Somebody gets mad at somebody else or they don't like a big corporation and so they just start a fire. And the technique of, of detective work for stopping fires that are brought by arson are terribly uh, important. Chemical drops and the whole technique of chemistry control of fires is something of great concern and we've been trying to do a lot of educational work uh, on it. We've got a program called Trees for People uh, to improve the management of the, the four million uh, landowners that have small land holdings in this country, but who total 60% of our total productive forest lands. These are people that don't know much about forestry, could care even less, and yet are sitting on enough land that unless we persuade them through a pleasant and educational techniques, are just never gonna produce the land potential that our trees should uh, be given. We've got a program called Tree Time USA, which is a project that we established in consultation with, uh, with forestry officials to get 75 million acres of land reforested during the next 10 years. And we've gotten pledges against that 75 million acres of 10 million acres from the United States government that will plant during this next decade. States have pledged 20 million acres to be reforested and uh, we've gotten uh, individuals to give us about another uh, 10 million. So we've, we've, we've worked toward 40 million acres as a start against the 75 million that have got to be reforested in our country if we're gonna have trees for the future. We've worked with the American Association of Nurserymen because so many Americans are living in urban areas and uh, people there don't quite know what to do with trees, but working with the nurserymen, we're having an educational program on how if you live in Brooklyn, you can grow a tree, uh, even if it's just out on your, your door stoop, and uh, it's proving to be a, an interesting thing. And the technique of controlling noise and also controlling pollution with trees is of course recognized uh, a value and one that we're pushing on hard. We're gonna have in Denver in August, a program on containerized uh, tree uh, planting. Containerized trees is something that, again, represents technological advancement in our field and that you're gonna hear a lot about. This is growing seedlings of any type that would be a commercial crop in a nursery, in a, in a, in a hothouse, so that the trees can simply be given the uh, appropriate amount of daylight, the appropriate amount of darkness, the appropriate amount of moisture, and can be accelerated and brought along much faster than the trees just in a normal nursery. And then they're packaged in a little tube of biodegradable paper and uh, can be planted at any time in the year. Now in a state like Indiana or North Carolina even, generally your planting time for trees is typically in the late winter, early spring, when the roots can get established while you have moisture and then so they can survive the hot summer. These trees being packaged, the little seedling being in a, a little uh, paper chute can simply by either a machine or by hand be planted at any time of the year with enough moisture and enough nourishment, nutrition reserve to survive. Uh, last August, Charlie, I planted three acres of longleaf pine on one of my tree farms in the, the worst possible month, the month when you just plain don't have tree survival and yet they're all doing nicely because they were nursery grown, they have hothouse grown, they're they're excellent plants, super trees, and uh, it means that we can increase our planting span to around the year instead of just normally confining ourselves to two or three months. We have uh, encouraged a lot of programs that maybe you've heard about. Did you, do you remember recently on television that Dotson said if you'll come in and drive a Dotson, we'll give you a free seedling? Uh, they did that, it was an effective program. 
the uh, hunt foods, hunt tomato ketchup, things like that, have had for months now on their label a little slip saying that if you'll mail this in with a quarter, we will give trees to the United States Forest Service and you'll help plant a national forest. Uh, TWA has had the same program. We've got banks that are planting things like this. Here's a regular throat swab, but it's got three balsam fir uh, uh, seeds in it. And uh, this bank, for example, in North Carolina is giving out about two million of these. You simply, during the months of March and April, get one of these things, stick it in the ground, and it gets enough moisture, and the tree just starts right out from this little swab. We've got all kinds of tree generation programs going that will both encourage adults and also, we hope, uh, interest uh, young people. We've got an American registry of trees. People are made much more aware of trees when we have contests to find out the largest and the oldest and the most historic tree of all the species, and we keep a register of that. I know that Indiana has one or two of the largest trees. I think the mulberry is one of them, and uh, many in our registry are giant trees that have been recognized, and we even can get them registered as national landmarks and, uh, and thus preserve them for all times. We've got a bicentennial tree program, taking historic trees, like trees in Boston or, or uh, the Davy Poplar at Chapel Hill, getting the seeds from them and regenerating trees and perhaps selling them as local bicentennial projects so that famous trees can be propagated, uh, their, their offspring seedlings can be propagated uh, over the years. We've got a history of forestry in the United States that's being written. One of the chapters in that will be the cradle of forestry, which began when Commodore Vanderbilt, who made his money with the New York Central Railway System and had been going around Europe traveling with the royalty, decided to build himself a great castle, and he did. It's called the Vanderbilt Mansion, and it's down in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And the Commodore, having built this fantastic place that was so elegant that he then started inviting European royalty to come and see his great castle, which was in many cases greater than theirs, he'd sit out on the porch in the afternoon and he looked out over beautiful sunsets, and he said, I'd like to just buy all those trees out there, which he proceeded to do, and that turned out to be what is today Pisgah National Forest. And he got a young man to come over uh, from a school in Germany, a young man named Gifford Pinchot, who went on to be the governor of Pennsylvania and became the real reason for Teddy Roosevelt's program, which caused Teddy to be known as the first conservation president in history. Gifford Pinchot had been interested in forestry, could find in 1893 no school in America that taught forestry, so he went to Germany and enrolled in a school of forestry which was being operated by a Dr. Schenk. So when Commodore Vanderbilt found that he could get no American trained forester, he hired Pinchot, an American who'd been trained in Germany, brought him over, and the first forestry practices in America were established there in what is now Pisgah Forest, just outside Asheville. So after about five or six years, Pinchot went in and said, uh, Commodore Vanderbilt, I've done about all I feel like I can do here. I want to go back to Pennsylvania and get involved there. Pinchot said, you can leave if you'll get somebody to take your place. Pinchot sent a cable to Germany to his, the head of the school, Dr. Schenk, and said, uh, have an interesting job in America. It will pay, I think it was $4,000, which was more money than anybody in, in academia had ever heard of at the time. Uh, can you accept? He got a cable back four days later, got signed by Dr. Schenk, just said, I'm en route. And Schenk came over, took, uh, took Pinchot's place, and founded the first school of forestry in America, which was called the Biltmore School. And if you go out into the Pisgah Forest today, there's a, a marvelous uh, uh, little museum and keepsake place including the old school that Dr. Schenk operated out in the woods, and it's called the Cradle of Forestry in the United States. Well, let me just talk for a minute about the future of trees, since uh, architects and people who want to build things are going to be hung on it quite a bit. The Ford Foundation has an organization funded by Ford called Resources for the Future, a group of men who work in a building just alongside the Johns Hopkins Washington campus on Massachusetts Avenue in, in uh, the District of Columbia. And the resources for the future has been looking ahead at everything from our energy crisis to what other resources this country by 2000 or 3000 is going to need and whether we're uh, doing a good job of taking care of these resources. And their statement in this regard says, 
that the total timber consumption by the end of this century is projected at not quite three times today's requirement. In other words, 32 billion cubic feet as against a current consumption in this country of about 12 billion cubic feet of forest products. However, their forecasts, based on how we seem to be going, synthetics, and substitute materials, etc., show that there's going to be quite a diversity of, of product in what we use for wood fiber. The demand for veneer logs, for example, for, for plywood is obviously going to be rising tremendously. It will rise sevenfold because we know that plywood has so many diverse uses and actually you get more strength per unit of wood fiber than you do out of, of just a piece of wood itself. And the consumption of pulp wood is going to be uh, increasing by about three and a half or four times between now and the year 2000. This is, is balanced by a much more moderate rise in the requirement for saw logs because construction materials continue to be substituted a good deal by the various uh, alternatives that we, that we know in construction. And uh, there will presumably, unless we get into a worse cru uh, fuel crunch, be a, a continuing decline in fuel, which 100 years ago was, of course, the major uh, use of, uh, of our forest products. In the end, why the uh, construction and paper together will account for the major use of our wood products by the year 2000. In addition, we're going to see a continuing demand for our uh, great capability in the production of uh, forest products by the rest of the world. We know that the great timber source for all of Europe is, is Scandinavia. And yet one third of the lumber production of the United States equals all of Scandinavia plus uh, Germany and uh, Switzerland combined. So we must continue to be a major source of wood uh, fiber for the entire world. Japan right now, for example, is paying so much uh, to buy our veneer peeler logs that uh, a company as big as Menasha Plywood up in uh, Wisconsin two years ago just sold out, said we can make more money selling our logs to the Japanese than we can paying American wages and producing veneer in this country. They literally went out of business. The, uh, the factor that must be stressed at this point in connection with the future use of our trees is the multiple use concept. And that is one that has been well discussed by foresters Forestry, remember, as a profession in this country is now just 75 years old, having been started by Dr. Schenck down at the Biltmore School. So in 75 quick years, we've, we've developed quite a new breed of, of uh, technical people in this field. And as they look at it, more and more schools, such as North Carolina State, which is playing Marquette right now. Does anybody have a score? I'm about as nervous about it as I am at uh, the end of this program. Uh, North Carolina State, for example, just recently has uh, changed the name of its School of Forestry to the School of Forest Resources, which broadens you out into the multiple use concept and begins to parallel those things that the U.S. Forest Service has been getting into. Automatically, the first major alternate use of trees is recreation, because America's uh, a five day week or a four day week is pushing Americans out. We love the out of doors, we need the out of doors, and obviously going into our forest lands, both federal and state, is an important multiple use aspect of the use of trees. And that incidentally includes private lands. More and more states are making arrangements with private large landowners, such as pulp companies or such as other companies, power companies and others, to allow those private lands to be given a tax status and protection by state rangers to allow the public to go into those private preserves and have the protection of the state law and the advantage of the state taxing arrangement to make sure that more and more Americans can enjoy lands which otherwise would be shut out. Incidentally, one of the major causes of arson we've discovered is the fact that people resent large land holdings into which they can't get for legitimate purposes, fishing or boat launching or just hiking or, or picnic. And the fact that more and more private landowners are now opening up their land and letting state rangers patrol the land and letting the taxes provide for such things as fire or abuse by the public is making uh, much more land available uh, on an intelligent basis. Wildlife. 
Well, if we don't have the cooperation and the intelligent management of wildlife in connection with our national, uh, federal, and state uh, forests, then the end of, of hunting as we've known it is coming along too because we just see the, the, the complete erosion of the, the land base for wildlife uh, as we drive down the highways these days. Clean water, which is uh, probably the most critical uh, aspect of, of our survival picture, is so related to forestry that it, it almost uh, doesn't require mention. But I do know this statistic, which has been developed in North Carolina, and that is a mature, uh, one acre of mature forest land in western North Carolina will produce 30,000 gallons of water a year. Uh, an amazing statistic, but true, and it shows quite clearly that unless we keep forest lands up in our upper watersheds, cities are going to increasingly have great amounts of trouble. Clean air. We know the direct relationship of forests to clean air and the cap capability of trees to simply take carbon monoxide and other noxious fumes and to cleanse them. And now many cities are putting green belts around for the very reason that they are indeed helping to absorb the, the uh, uh, noxious gases that, are, that cities are, are generating. And I think also the value on a multiple use basis of forest lands should include very importantly, simply the aesthetic value of forest lands, a place where Americans in this day of noise and smoke and dirt and confusion can get out and find peace and aesthetic pleasure. It's a terribly important thing, and therefore keeping our forest lands in that state so that they will provide Americans pleasure and refuge. We are basically earth-oriented people, and we must get back to the earth, and we must do it under pleasant circumstances which forests make possible. An assistant uh, professor of forestry down at Clemson has come up with this interesting thing in terms of trees for the future. In connection with our energy crisis, these are important facts. It takes approximately 430 kilowatt hours of energy to process a ton of wood into useful products. Processing a ton of steel requires 2,700 kilowatt hours, more than six times as much energy to handle the ton of steel as opposed to the ton of wood. Aluminum requires 17,000 kilowatt hours, 40 times as much energy to produce a ton of aluminum as a ton of wood. Then for every ton of finished lumber, only 3.4 tons of raw material is processed. For steel and aluminum, the ratio is 10 to one, 10 units of steel, of, of the raw material to get one unit of steel and in the case of aluminum, 15 raw units to get one unit of aluminum. That becomes very important and becomes a very critical thing when you're talking in this day and age about the use of energy to create uh, uh, products that we, that we need. The other thing that goes without saying is the fact that lumber happens to be a renewable resource, but you once dig that steel and it's gone, and there's no more down where you dug that ton, ditto uh, bauxite for aluminum. In all of this, as important as trees are and as placid as the subject may seem, because it's sort of like being for motherhood and the flag if you say you're for trees, quite the contrary is the case. We're in the middle of tremendous Any areas of controversy here? right now. I'll read you just an example. Here's a letter just mailed out to millions of people recently, signed Lawrence Rockefeller. Dear friend, what would you think of a forester who cut down the trees faster than they could grow? who scarred the land by stripping vast tracts bare, who hastily logged areas proposed by conservationists for preservation as wilderness. That forester is the United States Forest Service. The forests are your national forests. Spanning 40 states with 187 million acres, they are the last great remnants of our once limitless frontier. What happened, we may ask, to the good forester who cared for the forest as a natural whole of soil and water, trees, animals, and birds, who selected only the mature timber and replanted what he cut, who was conscious of generations to come. The good forester has nearly gone. He is being replaced by the sales agent. The sales agent listens to the tim timber industry, which has found it more profitable to cut down our forests than to replant its own. Now that letterhead is Natural Resources Defense Council Incorporated, headquartered in New York. 
the Lawrence Rockefeller is the son of the Lawrence Rockefeller, who is the famous member of the family who's now in his, what, 50 year span, 50 to 60 year span. This is the son who has the same name and, and uh, doesn't bother to make the distinction as to whether it's father or son. The letter is an example of the scare type approach to a given uh, subject like uh, the, you know, the endangered species thing where they on a picture of an eagle say it's the last one you're ever going to see and it may be. In this case, uh, the United States Forest Service deserves some defense and uh, has gotten plenty of defense because this letter is, is, uh, is quite harsh and is quite inaccurate in some of the things that it's saying and yet there's enough of a germ of truth there to, uh, to make the case. Let's face the fact that the United States Forest Service, because the chief forester of the United States is appointed by the White House, becomes an agent of political uh, decision. And hence, you've got foresters who are doing their best, but ultimately, what they do, the end product of what they do, is determined by political decisions. Now, the Nixon administration has been under acute fire from conservationists on all sides, including our organization from time to time, over the fact that it has been stepping up two or three times the normal cut of trees in national forests in order to supply more uh, trees, ostensibly to produce construction lumber to solve the housing uh, shortage and to allow, although that shortage is not uh, as acute anymore, and uh, the, the uh, implication is there that it's just simply to make it possible, as this letter implies, for the timber industries to go over instead of cutting their own trees to uh, cut trees in the national forest lands. At the same time that it was increasing the cut of trees on national forests, the uh, present administration was cutting the budget for forest fires, which is disastrous because anybody who knows how you cut a tree knows that you have lots of laps left in the woods and you increase tremendously the fire hazard. To say you're gonna cut two or three more times, times more trees in national forests and to have less fire protection is suicidal. That's even what the chief forester of the United States who answers to the president was forced to say when Congress said, how come you're doing this? Furthermore, if the use of forest land for recreation is an important adjunct of forestry, and it is, then why don't you let people have more and more recreation facilities? This administration has sharply cut the amount of money that it's allocating for the use of recreation purposes in our national forests. So there are grounds for criticism, and yet this is typical of many letters of this sort, not quite on target, because the commercial foresters of this country after all, are hired by companies in the timber industry that don't want to see themselves go out of business. They've got to have trees coming along. So they are proposing what's called intensive forestry. And those are things that sometimes shock the conservationist or the environmentalist, but which nevertheless have got some basis. In fact, if you're going to try to have a country with 200 going toward 250 million people, the commercial forester, first of all, says that a tree is a renewable resource and therefore you manage it like an agricultural crop. And you know what you do with agricultural crops, you put fertilizer, you till the land, you intensely cultivate it, and you produce the most corn that you can, or the most potatoes, or the most cotton. The dedicated environmentalist organizations are saying, like the Sierra Club is an example, that a tree is a gift of God, and you ought to just leave it out in the forest and leave it like it is, and uh, when it gets old and, and disease ridden or a fire burns it or when it gets old enough it'll fall down and another tree will grow and that it will be nourished by the the tree mold that of the leaf mold that that has fallen to the ground the commercial forester merely says look that's a beautiful theory but we've got to do some things such as have even age forests and an even age forest means you just can't afford anymore to go out and cut a tree here and a tree there better, they say, ecologically, to go in and just clear cut, strip the land, and then go right back in and replant trees. Now, any of you that have seen a clear cut forest know that it's a horrible looking mess for about two or three years. Then the new trees that are planted under scientific management come along and it begins to look pretty intelligent again. Also, when you do that, while you're planting trees at the same time, they all get them out the same amount of, of shade, the same amount of rain, the same amount of sunshine, and they've got a much better chance of coming up on an even basis. It's tough on wildlife. Wildlife thrives on 
on uh, mixed forest uh, uh, foliage, that is, little trees and big trees, where you just have an even age forest coming along, wildlife doesn't have enough protection, and it's definitely a disadvantage to it. But onto these new forest lands, which have been clear cut, they're putting the super tree. And the super tree is genetically developed seed that will produce one, well, let's just say at least 33, if not 40 to 50% more timber out of the given seed, out of the seedling, than was the case before they began genetically perfecting the tree. Furthermore, it's grown under ideal conditions as a seedling uh, to be free of insect and, and other problems that would, uh, would possibly grab it if it were left to nature. Monoculture is another thing that the environmentalist is attacking, but which the conservationist, the commercial forester, says has got to be done. Monoculture merely means large tracts of the same species. And it makes sense. You know, let's face it, if you're growing cotton, you don't put half cotton, half corn, half potatoes, you are a third each. Why, you, you do indeed go in with all pines or all poplars or something of that sort, and you can manage it a lot better. New techniques, reseeding from the air, planting your trees by airplane and helicopter, even coating them in things that, that rodents uh, and insects won't devour until the seed works its way down from the first rainfall into the ground and begins to germinate or the tubing planting that I was mentioning earlier, where you can plant tubes all year round. We've got to grow more timber on existing lands, and we can, by the best estimate of professional foresters, triple our lumber cut by the year 2000, which is another way of saying that we definitely are not, as alarmists would tell you, running out of timber. If we use proper techniques, we can increase the amount of timber that this country has and make sure that we'll have enough for a pulpwood, plywood, construction timber and uh, that uh, sort of thing. But we do know that we've got somewhere to do it. Right now, we've got 2.4 acres of forest land per capita in this country. At our present rate of growth, we'll have 1.9 acres per capita by the year 2000. One million acres a year are being taken out of forestry by interstates, by uh, power lines, and by suburban sprawl. And you're just kissing a million acres a year goodbye, and that's an awful lot of trees. You have got to have technology that will bring along greater uh, tree production in order to protect yourself. Well, the environmentalist says that this would be an ecological disaster, that you're going to unbalance nature and you're going to be real sorry. The, con the commercial forester says we're developing super strains of trees that are more disease resistant and under proper management we can protect them against forest fires far better than they can in a natural state. But there are lawsuits coming along and you've probably been reading about them. If any of you go skiing at Vail, for example, why the people at Vail one night were sitting up there in one of those, I think the top of the Holiday Inn, and were looking out, and they saw a big patch of timber beginning to be cut over on the next hill. Next day, they got a lawsuit and said, that's visual pollution. We don't want to look at a, at a bare hill over there. And the court's been holding that up for about a year and a half now. Maybe you've heard of uh, the Alaska Inland uh, Passage Rape, as they're calling it because the proposal there in uh, one of the national forests is to allow, under a contract bid, the cutting of about 200 miles of land that would be clear cutting. It, the, the contract will require that the company that gets that successfully bids on the thing will have to go in after cutting all the trees and replant others. But they just don't want to see 200 miles or so of forest lands just simply laid bare, raped as they call it, and, uh, and knocked off. So the compromise on that seems to be cutting smaller patches of trees and having, having visually a little bit less uh, pollution. Now another problem, a related one though, that the Forest Service is in right now is that of the Mineral King dispute. Maybe you've heard that name. The Disney Productions of, uh, of uh, Disney World fame has applied for rights to operate a ski resort in uh, the Sequoia National Forest, oh, about 95 miles, not far from Santa Barbara, 95 miles from Los Angeles. And uh, the Forest Service under existing federal law can lease 80 acres of land for 30 years to somebody for a concession as long as it's proved and it's a legitimate outfit and they post a bond and not do anything wrong, etc. Congress is being asked to amend the law to allow them in that and other cases in order to provide more recreation for the country to lease larger tracts of land for 50 years because in case of most major projects. You can't borrow money just on a 30-year project. If the lender thinks you're going to go out of business in 30 years and have the land reclaimed, well, they won't lend you the money. 
But Disney has got a pretty good reputation for running first-class establishments, and they say in that case they would like to have a major ski complex, but it would have to be in a national forest because that's about the only place that's left around California to do it. So we, we tend to support that. We think it'll have to be selective decision, but we do believe that in this instance it's worthwhile. But there's a Sierra Club suit to stop it, and thus far it has been a successful suit. At least it's got it uh, hung up. I would wrap up in a minute by saying that I think that, that young people in America, and especially those that are going to be oriented toward architecture or toward uh, uh, construction or toward the development of our country along intelligent lines, have got a great deal of common cause with those of us in the conservation field, especially oriented toward forestry, such as the American Forestry Association that it is, that we should have common cause in first and foremost, uh, protecting forests from fire and insects and uh, diseases, and to make sure that we continue to have in this country adequate forest and soil uh, productivity. That we definitely have programs that will cause idle acres to be planted. We in this country, and Europe proved it long ago, can no longer afford the luxury of just acres that are just washing down the hill and, and serving no purpose. We ought to have every acre that can produce something uh, into trees or at least a proper soil use. We should achieve multiple use for maximum benefits of all people. And that means not just have a forest and put a fence around it, but have a forest in which people can go out and recreate and picnic or hunt or just know that it's protecting clean air and, and clean water, that it's serving many purposes. We should continue to improve wildlife habitat and grassland management and to make sure that the recreational opportunities always follow with that other uh, use. We should definitely modernize mining laws, and especially when you see the White House beginning to say, let's waive these rules on strip mining and start gouging the country again just in the guise of, a, of an energy crisis, which even the administration says it thinks will be passed in just a few seasons. Provide more assistance to forest landowners. A lot of people just innocently don't know how to plant a tree today or how to get their, their acres busy, and yet the technology's there, and the, it's, it's very easy, and it costs almost nothing. And to keep forest taxation so balanced that you don't discourage people from just planting trees instead of turning it into a, a, a pizza parlor or a, or a condominium. And uh, work always for the improved uh, utilization and marketing of, of wood. Those, I think, are things that are common cause with us and that I hope as you take roles of responsibility in the, in the career world or in the political world or in the educational world, will strike you as, as a reasonable program for America in our natural resource program that will uh, uh, allow my visit with you tonight to have at least uh, struck a chord that's worthwhile. Thank you very much. That concludes tonight's performance.